four of us, we really have all the seasons. Molly was spring, Erica's winter, Michael is woodshop. I'm crazy. The four <laughs> seasons. Okay, so we, you know what we have to do first, right? Always funny. I have a question, and I hope you won't be offended by it, but were you alive in the 80s? <laughs> so I was waiting for a, another, a better time to say this, but I was negative one in the year 1987. Oh, no. Shut up, Ramin. I know, I'm a wee little 30-something baby. <laughs> Okay, well, hi everybody, and welcome to our media in 1987 review. Uh, we're getting extra nerdy with it this time, and uh, I have gamified portions of it. Um, so we're gonna put Erica, Ramin, and Molly, pit them against each other and see who comes out on top. But before that, we're gonna start with the section that we don't have any game for because none of us know it enough, and that's books. <laughs> Many years ago, I started to read Beloved Ooh. and I never finished. I don't even remember like why I stopped reading it. I did see that that Beloved is like one of the top five books of that year. Like apparently a lot of people thought it was really good. Yeah, and Toni Morrison is obviously iconic and it's supposed to be like one of her best works. And I maybe should pick it up again. Yeah, maybe you were just not in the right place when you started it. You know what I've discovered about myself? Because I started reading a lot more during the pandemic. I get all these like highfalutin ideas of reading like this great literature and this like really heavy nonfiction. And what I really enjoy reading is just trash. <laughs> this was read to me in school and I, enjoy I remember enjoying it. It's about a kid who is on a tiny airplane and the, the with just a pilot and the pilot dies mid flight and the kid like, safely crash lands the plane into a into a pond in the middle of nowhere and survives using basically just the hatchet that his mother got him. I love child survival stories. The movie's great. But I have also read the book. It's lovely. When I was reading it because um as we have discussed in the past, my family is from the South. <laughs> reading that book made me want to talk to my grandmother about what her life was like in a small town in rural Georgia in like the 40s and 50s. Because I think most of um, Fried Green Tomatoes takes place in like the 30s, right? Like like it's it's several generations, like part is like in like the 30s and part is in like the 50s and part is in like the present, which is the 80s. So and like it just made me, reading that book made me go like, it, it was really an impetus for me to start talking to, yeah, my own elders about their experiences in the South, which were obviously like, nobody had like abusive boyfriends. There was no lesbian stuff happening, but <laughs> that I'm aware of or that they were willing to tell me about. Also fried green tomatoes are delicious. <laughs> they really are. And the recipe for them was also invented in 1987. Oh, really? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Misery is a hugely important Stephen King. That's, that's, the, that's the movie with, and it's, mm, a real, uh, it's an iconic role for the actress who played it. It's it's a super fan, like kidnaps her favorite author and tortures him. Kathy Bates. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, we love life. we love a Kathy Bates uh, but, scene chewing uh, situation. But like yeah. the the iconic scene is really graphic. It's the guy strapped to a bed and she she attacks his legs with a sledgehammer. <laughs> um, I know exactly what you're talking about and I've never seen it. I, I don't want to ever see it. <laughs> Me neither, but I'm sure she's amazing in it. <laughs> yeah. And As a kid, I really liked Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, I had like a whole anthology of theirs. So I, I really love Calvin and Hobbes, but it's so weird to me that the image of Calvin that most people see is of him peeing on the back of someone's truck, mm -hmm. which happened once in one comic. <laughs> the s bumper sticker Calvin is like like a prankster. He, he looks like mis mischievous, but in that's not at all what's happening in, the, like that's not who Calvin is at all. <laughs> so He's it's kind weird. of innocent, isn't he? Kind yeah. of like naive and yeah. yeah. He's mischievous, but like not really in that um, Dennis the Menace sort of way where he's like destructive or anything. So yeah, yeah. it is weird. He doesn't do anything for the purpose of causing trouble. He'll right. 
like he has philosophical conversations with his stuffed tiger. <laughs> he's he's mischievous in a Snoopy kind of way. He's, and yet, he's from the mouth of babes kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Right. It also might have been that I liked him, by the way. It occurs to me just now, just because he had a tiger and that was my favorite animal. I felt that was important to add to the discussion. I've not read this Octavia Butler, but the one that I've read is incredible. And she is, you know, a powerhouse in sci-fi and fantasy fiction. And I need to read more. <laughs> yeah, I read Parable of the Sower uh, last year. And it was intense. Like... And that's the only word that I could think of to describe it. It also was like weirdly echoing the current events at the time, um, which made it, I think, even more intense. I, I would be interested in reading more Octavia Butler. I would like to read some of her writing sometime. Cause... Oh, is that her like autobiography about like her crazy like addiction recovery stuff? I think so. That was that was, that was her. Read. Yeah, that was her first sort of memoir, and I'm not sure if she talked about. Star Wars in that because we were still kind of just on the tail end of its popularity, but she did do another tell all later where she talked about all the Star Wars drama. Yeah, that's the other trash I love. I love a tell all, but but also like what an incredible person. Yeah, like she did so much for Hollywood behind the scenes as, as a script doctor that we will never know exactly what she did. You know, <laughs> she did a lot for women too. Yeah. Uh, the Art of the Deal came out in 1987, and we won't talk about the author of that. <laughs> you know, it's ghostwritten, so you can talk about the author of it all you want. <laughs> I adore the movie, although I think it might be worth revisiting, because I'm sure it's probably problematic the way people would view it now. I've heard people talking about it a lot recently, and how it's another, like, the Black person exists in the, in the story to make the white person better. Yeah. Uh, one book that I have read recently, in recent years, that uh, I should have read in high school, uh, but didn't, uh, was a wonderful, a wonderful novel called The Yellow Raft in Blue Water by Michael Doris, and I just, I highly recommend it. It's about three generations of women who are uh, part of the same family. They live in a in an urban suburban area, and they grew up on a, a Native American reservation. And it's and it's just a really beautiful, complex story about the relationships of women, the relationships of um, people with their heritage and their history, their background, and sort of coming to terms with it. It was kind of hard to pick up some of those 80s books. By the time we were reading adult novels in the mid to late 90s, it was hard to kind of go back to that backlist. Well, unless it was a really important work of literature that you were like yeah. assigned in school or something, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to be reading Dean Koontz novels from the 80s unless yeah. they're really into Dean Koontz. And I really shouldn't talk because there were also a number of Babysitter's Club books that were published in the nineteen in the early 80s and in 1987. Talk, I think another, re uh, another thing that's always interesting about it is that, like, for the most part, these authors are writing for current audiences. So we just come into this with a different set of experiences and we can't relate to things. Like, think about, like, reading some Jane Austen. Like, there are things that she can just say and doesn't need to explain that her audience knew. And we have to, like, wait, what? <laughs> right, but Jane Austen is also timeless. True. It's true. Like, it has timeless themes. Especially in something like Pride and Prejudice, where, like, the things that are just not done. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You don't yeah. completely get that, because it's... He's marrying below your station or above your station or all of that stuff yeah and i think people in modern eras are we're good at re at reading more into those generations and those time periods because we have read about them so often and we're kind of it's a little easier to associate with than say somebody from 100 years ago trying to read something that's current present day i mean downton abbey was wildly popular for a very good reason because it was relatable on many well, levels yeah, and the whole, like, historical fiction genre, especially of the bodice-ripping sort. I like tigers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, now moving on to TV. So this uh, this is when the three of you should start paying attention, because <laughs> there will be... Oh, are, is this the pop quiz part? <laughs> are we having uh, a test? In 1987, I was three years old, which is obviously too young to be watching primetime television. <laughs> However... I think a lot of these shows were in syndication just a few years after that in the early 90s. And I feel like they were all just like ubiquitous 
throughout my childhood, you know, um, so many of these shows were just like, I don't know, like the backdrop, I guess. Not that a TV show should be the backdrop to one's childhood, but. Well, we didn't have the internet yet. They, we did have outdoors, <laughs> but not to be, not to be like, kids these days don't play outside, but. And we clearly weren't busy reading books, were we? <laughs> no, we were not. <laughs> New TV shows in 1987, 21 Jump Street starring Johnny Depp. Beauty and the Beast, starring Linda Hamilton and Ron Perlman. I remember watching this with my mom a lot. <laughs> was that the one where he had, like, the weird, like, Cats the Musical makeup? Okay. And lots of prosthetics and stuff. It has a very, like, Phantom of the Opera vibe. <laughs> I, I feel like it was filmed through, like, a lot of filters. Like, it had, like, the Vaseline lens. Yeah, it? It, it, it takes place in, like, you know, 1987, some city. And he lives in the sewers, and she goes down to visit him in the sewers. Yeah, I think. The Bold and the Beautiful first aired in 1987, and I used to watch that with my great aunt and my great grandma. That was one of my mom's favorites. DuckTales. Yes! Okay. <laughs> was DuckTales like exclusive to Disney Channel for yes. the time? That's why, okay. I've always thought that was why I never really watched it as a kid because we didn't have Disney Channel. That, um, we watched it at grandma's house. <laughs> that and the gummy bears were the two things I was most bitter about only being able to see on the Disney preview weekends. Oh, oh my God. It was everywhere you looked. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> there you go. That is a show that like watched religiously. Yeah. Probably from as soon as I was aware of its existence, so probably not when I was three years old in 1987, but probably certainly when I was six years old. And it was part of the afternoon lineup, like the TV lineup when you get home from school. That's what, that's what right, was on. They would have reruns of it in the afternoon, but it was also part of the TGIF lineup. Yeah. If his name weren't Shadow, it would probably be Comet. <laughs> the thing about Full House is, like, does it really hold up? Like, I feel like it was just kind of horny and overly wholesome and not that it, interesting. But it was like that when it first aired. Like, it was all that was always the primary critique of it was, was you it know, was even too saccharine. Can we talk about some of the very special episodes of Full House? <laughs> I'm thinking, like, the DJ Tanner eating disorder episode. Yeah. Um, and the one, oh, oh, the one where she steals the sweater from the store. That was huge. She doesn't understand what credit means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As we review these specific moments from it, I realized that I don't really, even though I know I watched a lot of Full House, I don't really remember much of any of what I watched. And I'm pretty sure it's because as a kid, I probably had a closeted crush on John Stamos. What is Dave Coulier doing these days? Didn't he have like a whole um, like scandal or something? So I feel like a big trend around this time was people trying to hire what essentially became the Robin Williams, like the guy who can do yes. great voices and the guy who can do great. And I just don't think most guys are Robin Williams. This is a low rent Robin Williams. Do we want to also talk about the Aunt Becky college admission scandal? <laughs> oh my God. I forgot about that. That was right before the pandemic. So it kind of got wiped yeah, from my memories. It, it sort of, but like, I think like, didn't she just get sentenced? Like she's doing jail time. Lori Laughlin released from prison after two months sentence. And that mm. article is December 28th of 2020. So two she's- is not that bad. But then there's that 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 famous you know black woman who was serving five years for lying about where she lived so she, her kids couldn't get into the better school. So yeah. racism, not so wholesome now, are you, Full House? <laughs> Let's move on to a show that I hate. You know I never got into it. Married with Children is that it is one of those shows that, like like I said before was like ubiquitous during my childhood. Like it seemed like it was always on, and it is a show that also like. When you watch like pop culture sort of um, recap shows, like like what we're doing right now, when they talk about married with children, like it is like critically adored, and I honestly think I just was too young to get it. I, I would be interested in going back and revisiting it because. Like I think when I was a kid, I was like, "Who is this jerk guy that hates his family?" But I think like now, I think that the whole point of it was that like it was a subversion of shows like Full House, where it was like, actually, my family life sucks, and I wish I could be anywhere but here, kind of thing. 
Um, and like also just like the general like trashiness of them. It was sort of like a whole like the American dream is not all it's cracked up to be kind of, which yeah. I think my, if I were to watch it now, I think I might get that a little more. Star Trek The Next Generation premiered in 1987. Starring my husband, Captain Riker. Commander Riker. Commander Riker, God damn it. But Next Gen is awesome. I, I do think it's a legitimately good show and it was uh, worthy of the accolades. And without it, we wouldn't have had the the whole juggernaut of Star Trek. It might have just died with the original series. And instead, we have, what, five, six, seven great series that have come out of that now and several movies. It's a wonderful franchise. Yeah. Um, I rewatched a lot of it with Bob when he was doing a marathon through once. Um, the first season is not great. And it yeah. feels like they don't have their footing yet. But I think the one thing that makes seasons two plus better than season one of Next Gen is Riker's beard. <laughs> <laughs> Next show that premiered in 1987, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Another one I watched religiously because I was like, the age demo that they were after. My very first best friend was named Brian. And I remember I was probably five. So a couple years after 87, my mom saw that a family with a kid about my age moved in down the street. So she took me over to meet them and say hello. And like the moms put us out on the porch and then went inside to talk. <laughs> and um, I remember Brian and I had the most awkward conversation until one of us said, do you like Ninja Turtles? <laughs> and then I said, my favorite's Michelangelo. And he said his favorite was Raphael. And then we were best friends for several years. <laughs> okay. Everybody, which turtle did you identify with? I always went with Leonardo. I wanted to be Donatello, but I knew I wasn't that smart. So I thought I'll be the boss instead. Growing up as a, as a little kid, Michelangelo was my favorite just because his name was similar to mine. But now I am I'm definitely not a Michelangelo. I'm a Donatello or with a little bit of Leonardo. Which Sex in the City character are you, Ramin? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I actually kind of am Michelangelo. You might be. I think I'm a Michelangelo are. too. Yeah. Because well, he was the one that was described in the theme song as the party dude, right? <laughs> well, I'm sorry, one of the two of you has to be Raphael. Much like Golden Girls, we all have the one we want to be and the one we are. The Teen Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles show was one in a long line of cartoon shows that was mostly made to sell toys. Sell toys, yes. Um, cool. I had many toys. Like, I had the the truck, the, the van, that um, you could load these little pizzas into and like push a button, they shoot out of this thing on the top of the truck. I remember that. I, so like I had all the turtles, I had a splinter, but I didn't have an April. And some like play school like figurine was about the right size. So I had this like, this female figure that I pretended was April. And I remember one time I got really excited. I was playing in the basement and I went up to show my mom that I had made a wedding dress for April out of Kleenexes. <laughs> also premiered in 1987, The Tracy Ullman Show, which I only really thought as relevant because that's when The Simpsons premiered as a sketch on The Tracy Ullman Show. Okay, but also Tracy Ullman is iconic. The last show that I listed that premiered in 1987 was Unsolved Mysteries. <gasps> I just re-watched that. I binged the whole thing last summer because I needed something to depress me and scare me during the pandemic. And I'm telling you, that holds up really well. Like some of them are are like kind of silly and, and, you know, maybe just not very good mysteries. But I, I mean, a lot of those episodes, there's a reason it was on for so long. It was so good. I always Roberts. loved the episodes that were like more about like UFOs and stuff than the ones that were about like actual like murders and missing people. See, I liked the ghost stories. Yeah, yeah, me too. Now we come to the first really nerdy moment of the show. Oh God, he has visual aids. I do. Underneath these little sh sh sheets of paper are the top 10 Nielsen rated shows of, of 1987. We're gonna do a little Family Feud style game. We're gonna keep going until either we get all of them or each of you has three mistakes. I'm gonna say The Cosby Show. The Cosby Show was number one. <laughs> Full House has gotta be on the list somewhere. 
It was not. Error has one error. I understand that just because something does, I don't like something or it doesn't remotely interest me doesn't mean that millions and millions and millions of Americans aren't obsessed with it. So I'm going to say Monday Night Football. That was like number 12 or 13. So Are I, you I, kidding yeah. me? I feel like it was later, but Golden Girls? That is on the list. That is number four. Cheers. Cheers is on the list. Mm -hmm. That was Cheers. number three. I'm going to go with The Wonder Years. The Wonder Years is on the list as number 10. Tied for number 10. So Molly has one point. Oh, Murder, She Wrote? Murder, She Wrote is on the list. That is number nine. I know my parents watched this one a lot, so I'm going to say Matlock. Matlock is not on the list. I'm going to go with Family Ties. Michael J. Fox. No Family Ties. <sighs> 60 Minutes? 60 I'm... Minutes is on the list. Ernie <laughs> now has 22 points. I'm going to guess Alf. Alf is on the list. Oh, it's uh, good. Alf. Good. Top rated shows of 1987. People I... watched that god awful television show. Depressing, <laughs> right? Which makes me think that my next guess is way off the mark, which is Cosby Show spin off A Different World. That is on the list. It is number oh, two. Number one, Cosby Show spin off was number two. I bet they were back to back on air. I feel like this wasn't that big, but I'm going to say fame. No. I'm pretty sure that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was popular right out of the bat. So that's my next guess. I'm sorry, Erica, you are out. No! You know what? This is a risk, but I'm going to say Night Court. Yes. I'm throwing my money behind Molly now, by the way. <laughs> I just had to get my mojo going. <laughs> to remain. I'm going to go with my gut here. Transformers. No. Damn it. I'm just going to say The Love Boat. No, not the love boat. So Molly is out. I'm going to go with L.A. Law. Nope. Number six That's on the list. was Who's the Boss. Uh... And number five was Growing Pains. I was going to guess Growing Pains. I was... Let's get a move on and talk about movies. Movies released in 1987. Huge in 1987, La Bamba. Oh my God. You could not escape that song. <laughs> no, you could not. And, and it's actually an older song because the movie was about the song from like the 50s, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was about Richie Valens. <laughs> Batteries Not Included, starring Jessica Tandy. I remember, it must have been like Christmas or something. Somebody had rented it or something and we were all watching this movie at my grandmother's house. All I remember is the little alien robot things that were like hamburger shaped that flew around. But it was one of those movies that you forgot existed. The Brave Little Toaster, which I have fun. Aww. God, but also what a terrifying movie. So scary. Also 87, which I'm sure we'll have more to talk about. Dirty Dancing. Yes, okay, me, 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 me. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't know what to say about it. <laughs> you know what? It's interesting because that movie, like, considering that it's called Dirty Dancing, there's not a lot of so-called Dirty Dancing in that movie. And I watched like a like a documentary about it. I'm, I don't know if any of you guys have seen it because it was like on Netflix. It was like the movies from our childhood or whatever. And they basically say that the title came first. Like the person who wrote Dirty Dancing like wanted to make a movie called Dirty Dancing, and then like wrote it based on that so like there's like the couple of scenes where they're like dancing and they're all like grinding up on each other but like most of it is like mambo <laughs> the scandalous thing in that movie is the abortion the back alley abortion mm -hmm. <laughs> that happens which like that was a thing where it was like i did not understand what happened in that movie until i was like 14 and then it was like because like nobody ever says it it's like she's pregnant they get her money to go to see this doctor. Oh, I swear he's a real doctor, it's fine. And then she gets very sick. I remember like 
not getting it until he was older. And I was like, oh, she had an abortion. So I think I've talked to you all before about this YouTube channel that I really like called The Take. They've talked a lot about Dirty Dancing and about how it's like one of the most feminist movies of the 80s. And yeah, kind of is, isn't it? it it's, yeah. it's really all about babies like sexual awakening on her yeah. own terms and yeah. being the person that she wants to be despite what her family wants. Yeah. I mean, queer to queer for, for the first second. Patrick Swayze has never done it for me. Okay, okay, it's not just me. He is he is a man for women. <laughs> Honestly, though, I feel like part of it is this movie and the fact that, like, for me, I associate this movie with, like, just all the biggest rom-com schmaltzy tropes out there, right? Like, there's the musical number that's not really a musical number, but is a musical number for, like, 10 minutes. There's, like, the... the the steamy makeout sessions to Molly's point about like dirty dancing and also like the lake he falls scene, in love with guys. a bad boy. What? The lake scene where they're practicing the jump in the lake. <sighs> now, the thing is like you talk about all these schmaltzy romance tropes and like I think Erica probably feels the same way I do. It's like that to us was like the ultimate fantasy. You know, mm -hmm. and um, and like when I talked earlier about like reading trash, it's like that is what I want. I want to be like totally taken away into this completely fictional world where men are kind of perfect. This was a time period where it was suddenly becoming OK for a male to be. He wasn't emasculated by anything. He wasn't being a jerk to prove his point. He was suddenly becoming compassionate. He was becoming more encouraging of his partner. He was becoming somebody who is supportive and encouraging and educating rather than somebody who talks down to you and bosses you around. It's a great movie. I And you know what? I think it's a movie that has been dismissed by the sort of male intellectuals throughout the years as, you know, chick flick, frivolous romance but like these kinds of movies are important and these kinds of stories are good to tell these kinds of fantasies for women are good to have good morning vietnam with robin williams and forrest oh. whitaker oh. So, before, long before i knew the movie good morning vietnam i remember listening to the soundtrack on road trips mm -hmm. which was basically because like if i don't know if you guys have seen good morning vietnam but it's about a radio show that was like, it was like an expat who was in Vietnam who played a radio show that was listened to by American GIs fighting in the Vietnam War. And so it's all like this iconic 1960s, you know, classic rock and soul that we all know and love. And the soundtrack is is like the radio show with Robin Williams sort of coming in between sort of um, as the DJ. Um, so I knew that long before I saw the movie. And then I, I saw the movie and it's actually, um, it's, 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 it holds up. <laughs> all right. The one we've all been waiting for, Moonstruck. Oh, snap out of it. But I love Moonstruck. It makes me think of the movie Juno, which came out in the mm -hmm. 2000s in it's tone. It's a sophisticated comedy. Yeah, like it, not in terms of subject matter, but in terms of like the, yeah, the style. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think, I, I know, but I, I do think Cher is iconic in this and really good in it. Um, she won the Oscar. Yeah, for good reason. And also one of the all time best opera scenes in movies, right? That one and Pretty Woman. <laughs> Nicolas Cage, who in that movie, when he puts on the tux for the opera scene, Nicholas Cage is not supposed to be hot. <laughs> but like, he's kind of hot in that movie. Um, also in 87, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. That was another one that I only saw in recent years. And it was it's a little long, but it Thanks was surprisingly good. Erica gets first crack at this one. The Princess Bride. Oh, my heart of hearts. I could speak it from the beginning to the end. Um, I, I always say it's my second favorite movie. Um, and my first and second favorite movies both star Robin Wright. So um, <laughs> first? it should be Forrest Gump and The Princess Bride yeah. uh, because I'm a big cornball. I say it's in the contest for like perfect movie. 
like all time perfect movie because it has so many good elements. It has incredible storytelling, incredible acting. The direction is really good. The art direction is really good. The soundtrack is really good. Like for all its kind of cheesiness and all of its kind of foibles, it's it's a classic for a reason. I mean, honestly, like, is there anything we could say about the Princess Bride that hasn't already been said? Is the thing like it's obviously just like massively iconic. This one's for Erica, Spaceballs. So this time that we're talking about is, you know, Star Trek The Next Generation. The original Star Trek is having a resurgence. And you've had this huge smash with the Star Wars movies. So now they decide they're going to come in and make fun of it. And they've made fun of literally every trope. It's primarily in the Star Wars vein, but it gets into that kind of science fiction world too. And it's it's one of Mel Brooks's. um better ideas it's got a lot of these actors that we know for other things and you kind of just they get the chance to play and just be stupid like you've got john candy as the chewbacca wannabe and you've got bill pullman as like the lead kind of hunky hero and um you know the main heroine is is like princess leia even except even more feminist than with more attitude when i think of Spaceballs, i think first of rick moranis yes i totally <laughs> forgot until i was looking this up joan rivers is in it she was. She was the C-3PO type robot. Oh, she was funny. so good. A movie that I will always remember because mustache, Three Men and a Baby. <laughs> what? Men can't take care of babies? They would just be a bunch of bumbling idiots. I remember seeing it. You remember seeing the mustache. Anything. <laughs> so this movie is not good, but it is like... I do like this movie in the the same part of me that like enjoys love actually or likes really like big blockbuster movies that are just supposed to feel good even though the writing is not great and like but uh, I do remember though uh, I mom and I would always like when we got takeout and stuff rent this movie or it would be on TV and for some reason I have seen this movie probably at least five times in my life. I never would have taken you for such a big three men and a baby fan. I'm not like a fan. It's just, it happened to be on TV when we were like- You admit it. (laughs) Another one of those films that I've seen the end of many times because I watched the movie that was right after it on the pirated tape, The Witches of Eastwick. I know I've seen this movie, but I feel like it was not as good as I had wanted it to be when I watched it. I often get it confused with Death Becomes Her, which is similar, but with Meryl Streep instead. (laughs) All these different whip movies with ground dom women. (laughs) I was gonna say gay icons. (laughs) Same thing. Now we are on highest grossing films. Um, So this time we're gonna set the order by, um, by score order. So since, um, so Erica will go first. Then Molly, then Remain. Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon is on the list. That is number nine. You get two points for that. Predator. Predator is not on the list. God damn, I'm bad at this. Princess Bride. Princess Bride is not on the list. Remain's got one strike. Oh, shit. Yeah, it didn't do well when it first came out. Or it didn't do great, anyway. Because they had miserable tastes in 1987. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, and a lot of these like cult classic types are cult classics because they were not popular initially. Yeah. I'm going to say Hellraiser. Hellraiser is not on the list. I'm going to say Robocop. Robocop is not on the list. Really? Just to take it out of other people's mouths, I'm going to say Dirty Dancing. Dirty Dancing is not on the list. Damn. I'm never going to be a chick flick in highest grossing. Good morning, Vietnam. That is on the list. That is number four. Erica's the- making a comeback. So you have just made how many points? That's seven points. Mm-hmm. And Erica is now in second place with 18 points. To Molly. I'm going to say La Bamba. La Bamba is not on the list. Molly is out. Oh! Three strikes, no whammies. This is way harder than the TV one. Ouch. The Lost Boys? No. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're hard. sucking on this round. I'm going to say The Untouchables. The Untouchables is on the list. That yeah. Is... Wow. So you're right. that And that tracks with Good Morning Vietnam. You're, that yeah. Was... Mm-hmm. 
That's number Endless six. Endless boomer nostalgia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Erica gets five points. Erica is now in the lead with 23 points. Planes, trains, and automobiles. That is not on the list. Yeah. John Candy was huge, but... Yeah, he was. I'm going to say Beverly Hills Cop 2. Beverly Hills Cop 2 is on oh, the list. Oh, I was going to guess that one. I was going to guess that too, but I didn't oh. get So now oh. Erica adds eight points to her total. <laughs> She's got 31. Okay, so tell me Superman 4 is also on the list. No, Superman 4 is not on the list. No. You are okay. the rest of the list. Number 10, Witches of Eastwick. Really? Oh, the number, gays were in power. <laughs> number eight, Stakeout, which is one of the ones that we listed and none of us had anything to say about. Mm -mm. Number seven, The Secret of My Success, which, again, we had nothing to say about. Did it have a Michael J. Fox in it? Yeah. Number five, Moonstruck. No one said The moon? share properties are crushing it. <laughs> number two, Fatal Attraction. That was going to be my next guess. I thought about saying that one. And See, number one... Nobody was guessing. Number one, three men and a baby. <laughs> oh. Are you serious? <laughs> so, another movie related game. This time, it's sort of favorite movies. So, I compiled this list by looking at Ebert's list, by looking at Consequence of Sounds list, and by looking at Ranker's list. So, Ebert, we're all more familiar with him. Consequence of Sound. I chose because it had a different list than Ebert or Ranker did. And Ranker's list is people on the internet voting for it. So we are using the same system that we just did for this round. Our order is Molly, then Ramin, then Erica. I'm going to go right in with Fatal Attraction. Oh, wow. Fatal Attraction is not on this list. <laughs> Princess Bride, god damn it. Actually? Are you? No? Ebert, you're a tasteless no hack. No way. Okay, Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon is number two. Woohoo! So Erica gets nine more points. I'm going with Wall Street. Wall Street is not on the list. Come oh. on, they did an early 2000s reboot of it. You have got to be kidding me. Moonstruck? Moonstruck is on the list. Oh, that is number four. Go. Ramin gets seven more points. Woohoo! Okay, Dirty Dancing. Dirty Dancing is not on this list. This is bizarre. Whose favorites are we? Doing? I thought this was it's like. Dudes. So that is why I'm going to say Raising Arizona. Raising Arizona. Oh my gosh, it's not on the list. Sorry. Oh, fucking shit! <laughs> Good morning, Vietnam. Good morning, Vietnam. It's not on the list. Oh! Uh, Beverly Hills Cop 2. That is not on the list. <laughs> Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal Jacket is not on the list, Molly. Is that and if the one that I didn't say is, I'm never speaking to any of you again. Predator. Predator is oh, not on the list. Oh, I forgot Predator. Me. The Untouchables. The Untouchables is not on this list. You are on. Oh. This list was harder than I thought it would be. The rest of this list, number 10, playing Strange That's Monomaker. what I almost did! <laughs> I should have gone with my gut. Number nine, The Big Easy, which I don't know. I almost. I, I thought about that one. Number eight, The Last Emperor. I was looking at that. I was eyeing it. Number six, Wings of Desire. What? Number five, movie? RoboCop. I just want to point out RoboCop. all these, all these are above Princess Bride. You realize that, right? Because I guessed it and it wasn't on there. Number three, <laughs> Molly. House of Games, which is that mammoth one. If and it's three men and a baby. Number one, Broadcast News, Joan Cusack. So there's one more movie related game that does not inc include the board. So for this game, it's multiple choice. All right. So for this one, uh, we keep going until someone gets it. And you get five points if you get it right. 1988 Oscars, which is movies from 1987. Best actor of this list. I'm going with Michael Douglas for Wall Street. That is correct. Okay, to Ramin, who won Best Supporting Actor in 88. I'm not sober enough for this. Um... <laughs> 
Denzel Washington? No, to Erica. Uh. Albert Brooks and Broadcast News. No, to Molly. Um, I'm going with Vincent Gardenia in Moonstruck. No, back to Ramin. Wow. Sean Connery, the untouchable. That is correct. No way. I didn't know Sean Connery had ever won an Oscar. Best How dare you step on Sean Connery's legacy? Oh, I know this one. It's Cher and Moonstruck. Yes. To Ramin. I, Olympia Dukakis. <laughs> That's correct. Woohoo! Oh. <laughs> Erica. Which of these won Best Original original Song? Oh, wait, I know this one. You do know this one, Erica. Come I on, do you get this wrong, you're in trouble. I know this one. It's got to be I've Had the Time of My Life. Correct. Okay, good. Molly, what won Best Picture? My mind says Moonstruck, but my gut says The Last Emperor. Which one are you going to go with? Although, I, broadcast news is pulling me in its direction also. And of course, if I get it wrong, it's going to go to somebody else. So I'm just giving them ideas. So I should probably fill it up. Quit stalling. I'm going with The Last Emperor. Correct. Nice. Yes.